this is April Hunter, and you are listening to the All Bets Are Off podcast with Robbie Vega. What's up, Rock Soldiers? This is the rock star Robbie Vegas with another brand new episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. And sitting directly next to me, to my right, is WWE legend Demolition Smash. How you doing, sir? I am doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, thanks for agreeing to do it. Super short notice. I said it, and you're here. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> I just happened to be in the in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact I flew in from uh, Orlando, Florida, where it was 80 degrees and it's 40 here, so I'm freezing <laughs> to death. And here is in Niagara Falls, New York, not not the Canadian side. And uh, yeah, I can tell you're you were in Florida. You're more tan than I am. I'm very pale here, and. Uh, I want to talk to you about so many things right now, and they're just running through my head. But the first thing I I need to get out of the way is because I'm a big rock and roller. Is the makeup inspired by Kiss at all? No, I think Kiss was inspired by us. All right. I I believe you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know how it ever came about, but uh, it just worked when we did it one time. So then we just started painting her face all the time. So it was just kind of just a random thing. It just fell into your lap. Yes, exactly. Okay. When I, when I went up to uh, the WWF at the time mm-hmm. and became Smash the Demolition, that's we started painting our faces right then, and then it just stayed with us till now, even you know. Wow. Yeah, and I'm watching you guys do, do the makeup here just a second ago, and you got these little mirrors, and you're just doing it by hand in these little mirrors, and I'm amazed because I can't even put eyeliner on that way, <laughs> and you're doing a whole face paint like that. That's well, pretty incredible. Well, we've learned to do it in the the worst places you know we've done them outside we've we're doing them here in an auditorium because the dressing room's not open yet Mm -hmm. we're just trying to waste some time so there's something to you know we're only about two or three hours early but yeah right you know (laughs) give you something to do put a little paint on your face so what year did you actually break into the professional wrestling business i broke in the business about 1981 i believe it was right in there i went through uh eddie sharkey's wrestling camp Oh, wow. And were you already a wrestling fan, or, or was did somebody just approach you like, well, hey, do you want to get into this? Well, I was a fan all my life, and I grew up with Kurt Hennig, and Kurt Hennig got into wrestling because his dad was Larry the Axe Hennig. And then uh, it was myself, Rick Rude, and the Road Warriors. We all worked at a bar in uh, in Minneapolis, and one of the bartenders was Eddie Sharkey. Mm-hmm. So we used to throw guys out the bar, and he said one night, he goes, i got to get you guys into wrestling. That was in 1981, you said? That was in, yeah, roughly 81, yeah. So you broke in with Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect, essentially, and, and yeah, different War- camps. And the Road Warriors and Rick mm-hmm. Rude. Okay. Now, how the journey to get into the WWE, what was that like at that point in time? Well, it took quite a while to get there. Mm-hmm. I ended up leaving the camp, and I went to Hawaii and New Zealand and Tonga and Samoa all over there. I worked for uh, The Rock's grandmother, Mrs. Maivia. Oh, okay. And then uh, from there, I went down to uh, Florida Championship Wrestling, and Dusty Rhodes was the booker there. Mm. And then I went to Atlanta, where Ole Anderson was. Then he sent me down to Mid-South with Bill Watts. Mm. And I went with from Bill Watts, I went to Florida Championship Wrestling again. And from there, I went to Crockett, you wow. know, uh, NWA and all that. And then, uh, and this was wrestling every night, Double shot Saturday, Sunday. So I had a lot of wrestling under my belt at that time. And then uh, after a few years there, then uh, I ended up uh, getting the job with the WWF. So oh, wow. it was about five years of wrestling every day, all the time. So you went through every major territory that there was. Well, there was quite a few more. There was the AWA, and then there was Portland, Oregon. You never made your way through AWA? I never did, and oh, that's, wow. that's where I was from. But, you know, <laughs> I was always working different different other, you know, territories and other places. So so with, with that being said, because you, you did go through the territories, um, you know, nowadays we say that, you know, guys are green for such a long time. So you do, do you feel like it was quicker for you to not be considered green then because you were wrestling every single night? Oh, definitely. But, you know, every territory I went to, I learned more, and you wrestle different people in different ways, you know, that they worked. And so you kind of learned everything. But, uh, you know, even when I was in the WWF, when I was there for years, you, you still learn, you know, yeah. you, you learn all the time. 
Now, do you see a lot of differences? Because um, obviously you're still, you know, doing this thing. You're, you're traveling. You're here right now. I think you said you have Cleveland coming up and, and uh, a bunch of stuff. And you got Michigan coming up and things like yeah. that. Um, what, are, what are some of the major differences you're seeing from the territory days to the indie wrestling days? Well, I'll tell you, everybody, everybody now wrestling there, everybody's good. You know, <laughs> they just the indie wrestlers just don't get enough matches under their belt to really be good. Mm. And it's not their fault. It's just, you know, it takes time. And a lot of times uh, guys get hurt before they can because they, they're in front of a crowd and they have they probably shouldn't have been in front of a crowd and they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Mm. And, you know, that's kind of the difference. When we did it, it I mean, you wrestled every night and you were wrestling guys that have been in the business for years that could teach you. Yeah. You know, and they... Yeah. They led you through the matches and everything. Now you get two guys that never even work together and are in the ring a lot of times. But I've seen some of the indie wrestling that is just incredible. And it's it makes you feel good to see that still, you know. Yeah, no, I, I that's amazing to hear because I was actually kind of worried that you were going to be like, it's junk. <laughs> well, well, no, you know, the only the only difference is, is, you know, we told more stories. And it was slower, it was slower wrestling. But... You know, we're 330 pounds where the guys now are 180, 200, two and a quarter. I mean, yeah. big difference, you yeah. know. Now, do you still watch the WWE product? Um, not very often. No. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Charlotte Flair. You know, I've oh, been yeah. friends with Rick forever. And, mm-hmm. you know, his daughter and my son were friends way back when they were kids. Oh, wow. And uh, last WrestleMania, I thought she had the best match of WrestleMania. I I would find it hard pressed to uh, disagree with you on that one. <laughs> and I never would, th- I never would have thought <laughs> that a girls' match would be better than ninety percent of the boys' matches, the guys' matches. Well, but it was, and, and that's saying something too, because now WrestleMania is two days long. It, right. It's no longer just the the two or three hour you know right. spectacle that it used to be. You get, you have the whole weekend. Right. So she had the best match in two days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and maybe I'm just biased, but. You know, the matches were great, but God, when I saw her, I just thought, Jesus, what a match, you know? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Now, speaking of WrestleMania and staying on that topic, you know, you've had quite a few WrestleManias under yeah. your belt, and you guys are a legendary tag team. Um, who were some of your favorite people to work with at that period of time in your career? God, there's so many of them. You know, uh, you know Andre the Giant, Haku, the Strike Force. Uh, you know, the Heart Foundation, the Bulldogs. I mean, there was just so many unbelievable tag teams. Any one of them could have been the champions. You know, I absolutely agree with that, especially watching now. Um, there's not as many great tag teams. There's there's a lot of slap-together teams. Right. But in, in the era that you were just talking about, the tag teams were, in my opinion, could steal the show at any given night. And I thought they did. I mean, it took a heck of a main event match to beat a good tag match. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I was brought brought in there to be a tag team. Oh, and, that was specifically why they brought you. In. Yeah, okay. and and at that time there was probably you know ten tag teams that were you know top tag teams from all the small wrestling organizations that came up there. So you guys um, also would get paired together quite a bit with uh, the Road Warriors, who you mentioned Road earlier. Um, was that something that ever felt like? Did it get stale to you, or did you love it every I, time? I didn't. I didn't like it at all. No. I mean, they didn't. They didn't build it up. It was just thrown together, and it, it meant nothing. So then, it was hard to have a heel team and a baby face team. We were the baby faces, and they wanted them to be the baby faces, and it just, you know, it takes time to throw two teams like that together. Yes. And, yeah. and I, I think they screwed up, but you know, so it, it, you have no say. You think um, they could have got more mileage out of it then? Oh, yeah. shoot. We could have been in the same territory for a year or two years before we even got against each other. Yeah. You know? We could have we could have had all four of us could have been friends together, and then we fought them three years later. You know, I mean, there's mm-hmm. so many different angles you could have did. I mean, look at, look at the, nowadays, the Samoans. Yeah. Uh, yes. How many of them are out there now? Yes, yeah. The Uzos, the <laughs> Reigns, the... You know, there's like a now million the rocks of them. Back and the, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a million of them out there, you know? So at that time, too, staying on that topic of like kind of slapping it together, I, I recall then they brought in Crush. They brought now, in Crush. Was that up to you guys or did that just get handed to you? 
Well, at that time, Bill uh, got sick, so then okay. uh, they had to, you know, they booked the matches three, four months out. Yeah. So we had to have a partner, mm-hmm. and then they just brought Crush in, and we really liked Crush. He was a great guy. So that's where he became our partner. Okay. You know? And I, I remember, too, it was uh, the three of you, it was Demolition with Crush versus Road Warriors and Ultimate Warrior. And I remember that not having much of a buildup either. Is that Am I remembering that correctly? You remember that correctly. It was just all the guys with face paint. Oh, man. <laughs> Those were the hardest matches I ever had in my life. I mean, <laughs> man, you know, after being with these tag teams all the time, the best, the best ever, and then all of a sudden you're with a new team coming in that wants to get over, and then the Road Warrior, and then the Warrior who couldn't work a lick. I mean, it was like... <laughs> It was pulling teeth. Well, actually, I did get my teeth knocked out by the warrior. So oh, did you really? It was pulling teeth. Wow! During that whole, well, I don't know. Yeah, was it elbow in the yeah? yeah just, <laughs> wow! A real elbow in the chops. You know? I bet. Yeah, yeah. I've heard stories about uh, similar situations. Yeah, you know, I got along good with them, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, most people have really hated them, and I liked them, but uh, it was always good to me. You know. Okay. No, it for for that um, period of time too. It felt like. Not only was the tag team division stacked, like the company itself was stacked. Yeah. And, um, you know, Hogan and Macho and all those guys were, were on top. Um, do you do you have any, like, just off the top of your head, quick stories about, you know, working with Hogan or Macho or anything like that that, that you really enjoyed? Uh, you know, it was just, I mean, it's just like everybody else. I mean, they're, they're great guys. They were fun to work with. Yeah, I don't know if there's any other special stories or anything. It's just... You wanted to be on Hulk's card because every card he's on is sold out no matter what. Right. You know, and, you know, I don't know. It just it was just great being in the ring with him, you know. there's It seems from what you're telling, there's like a lot of camaraderie back then. Oh, a lot, it was a lot unbelievable. Of bonding. Is, is it because of all, like, you guys were working five days a week, so you just family? Five days a week. We, we were on the road 62 days one time. Oh, my God. And that's, and that's Saturday's double shot, Sunday's double shot. Then you do TVs on Mondays. Sometimes yeah. we'd wrestle three times on TV. Oh, my God. And then Tuesday TV and then Thursday TV. So, I mean, you might have 15 matches in a week. Oh, my God. So you're man. you're with all of these guys on the road, you know, going to the gym, going to, you know, mm. bars yeah. and bar, yeah. this and that. And, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you yeah. get to be really good friends with all of them. Oh, that's that's pretty incredible, and that's something that the indie scene doesn't have right now. Um, no. Unless you have um, a contract somewhere, you don't get that kind of travel time. But even the guys nowadays don't do that anymore. They, mm. you know, they they work, you know, three four days a week maybe or whatever, and yeah. you know they go in the dressing room and they play a few video games by themselves and stay by themselves, and they get their one or two friends. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's just not how it was with us. It was mm-hmm. you, you had a bond and. You, nobody could break that bond. Do you think uh, with today's, um, I don't know what to call it, I guess today's generation, today's era, that, that it's because of like the social media and the, the cell phones and the things like that, that that stop those things? No, I just think that the office up there has made it stop. Ah, you know, I, I mean, uh, the guys just don't go out anymore, mm-hmm. you know. You know, when we were out, there was trouble every night when all of us guys, <laughs> I mean, it was it was you know you couldn't do that anymore nowadays yeah you know yeah no, i mean you know you'd have a cooler of beer in your car and you'd drive 250 miles to the town mm-hmm. and you'd be on last and you'd probably lose 20 pounds in the ring because you had a <laughs> half hour match and it's 90 degrees in there oh man then you ride home you know you drink your beers and you'd talk and You'd meet at a rest area, the, your opponents, and thank them because you didn't want the fans to see you. And <laughs> you know, you, I mean, it was it was a pretty neat deal. You know, it, it's so different now. You know, we we used to have the good guys go out of one dressing room, and the bad guys go out of the other dressing room, and you could never ever talk ever. Oh wow! So we used to meet in the middle of the night, and you know, have a few beers and talk, and you know tell them you know what what you didn't like with them and they'd tell you the same and you'd work it out and the next night you'd have a incredible match because of that you know and then the referee you'd send messages back and forth with the referee he'd be running he probably ran 20 miles a night you know (laughs) running back and forth i love that that's excellent yeah because we we never went over the matches we just did everything in the ring so um, how many times, and this is going to be a, probably a really rough estimate, but how many nights in a row do you think you would work the same team 
on any given stretch of, of time on the road? Um, well, you know, it all, it all depends on, you know, if, if we were like in Syracuse, you'd wrestle the Bulldogs. Buffalo was close by, so then you'd wrestle the Hart Foundation. Oh, I see. You know, and then Rochester, you'd wrestle somewhere else. But then now you might be in L.A., then you're wrestling them. But never, and it was nothing was ever filmed or anything when you did that, the same team all the time. Right, right. So there were all house shows like that. So in a week's time, you might wrestle the Hart Foundation three times. You might wrestle mm-hmm. the Bulldogs three times. You might wrestle the... You know, strike force three times. Wow. Okay. You know. So, is there um, any team that people that you think people associate you with the most? I I know probably people will say the Road Warriors, but for me, when I think demolition, I think Heart Foundation. Like that, those were some of my favorite matches to watch as a kid. So, is there a team that gets brought up to you the most when people say, "How was working with who?" I, I think it's the Heart Foundation or the yeah. Brain Busters. Oh, the Brain Busters. Great matches with the Brain Busters. Oh. Uh, the Bulldogs. I mean, we, we had good matches with everybody, and that's why everybody wanted to work with us because we had really good matches. We weren't selfish where we wanted to eat guys up. You know, we had good matches. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, I'm allowed to say this or not, but I've actually heard the opposite about the Road Warriors, that they, they would eat guys up. <laughs> they would eat guys up, yeah. But, I mean, we <laughs> ate guys up, too, at TV, you know. Yeah, right. But uh, the main teams, you couldn't because those yeah. are the guys you got to work with every night. And you work with and, the Rockers too, right? Yeah, yeah Rockers, yeah. great guys. But, you know, the house shows or the TV shows that we had where we'd, you know, beat somebody up for six minutes or whatever, those guys were the most unbelievable guys out of everybody because they're the ones that got us over. Oh, okay. And we loved those guys. And, you know, we apologized before and apologized <laughs> after and take them out and buy them a beer, you know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> but, I mean, those were the guys that made the demolition. You know, without them, we wouldn't have been the badasses we were. So, you know. towards the the uh, the end of your run in, in WWE, was that your decision to end that run, or how did that happen? With the uh, demolition? Yes, yeah. Um, it was all of ours. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you, you all went off to do different things. Um, yeah. you, you weren't just out of the company or anything like right. that. Right. Which is why I was curious as to how that came to an end, because it just seemed like you were just this, you know, you were in the featured in the um, WrestleFest video game, and you guys were just kicking ass, and then you went on to do different things within the company. So what was the mindset there? It was just the Road Warriors were in there, and I think we were hurting them. Oh, I see. They, I see. they were the team. Okay. You know, we were no longer the guys anymore. And, mm. you know, we were similar, similar looks. We worked completely different, but... You know, uh, it's when the office gets something in their heads, it's it might not be right, but it is right to them. You know. Yeah, I got you. So, so that's when I went on to be the repo man, and yeah, you know, Bill went on, went to Japan, and you know, Brian was crushed, and yes. So we were we were lucky enough to still have jobs. You know? Yeah, and what a different um, like he, he uh, Brian remained crush, but yeah. what a different like style different look he had it was like these flashy yeah. colors and all that stuff yeah. at first yeah um but the repo man for you yeah um was that your idea was that or did that get it was handed? both of ours yeah. yeah uh what how did you feel about that run as a repo man because that's I, a memorable memorable character I, for me I, I loved it yeah. and it was supposed to be the end of my career mm. was i was going to be a baby face and i did a lot of stuff for make a wish and i really wanted to have that character turn baby face and just go and do make-a-wish stuff around oh, but wow. it ended up being where vince said uh, we're not going to make you a baby face and then that's when he said that then i said well i'm putting my notice in because i was told i was going to be a baby face at the mm-hmm. end of this run yeah and you're telling me no mm-hmm. so that's when i put in my notice okay. and it was starting to get hard to be a heel with that because i already you know and, and that character was to get everybody over yeah but to be a guy who could get could win you know yeah yeah so you know i worked with duggan savage you know all the top guys i worked with as the repo man yeah and uh i had a lot of fun doing it and it was to get those guys over to go against hogan or whoever yes yeah and then that's when i was gonna turn baby face and come back and then i can get all my wins back you yeah. know yeah. but it just didn't happen that way when when you were doing that character at the time, uh, I think it's common knowledge now that that was you. But at the time, was that common knowledge? Did the fans know that it was you? They didn't have a clue who I was because I I, I I lost shoot sixty pounds and yeah yeah you know worked different did goofy goofy <laughs> shit you know but uh, 
Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I had a good run, you know, a year and a half or so of that. Yeah. It was good. So what happens after you put in your notice and you leave WWE? What, what do you go off and do? Well, then uh, I ended up working at WCW. I had a couple of different gimmicks there, and I was the blacktop bully, which I thought was really starting to get over. Mm -hmm. And then we got I – was, I was wrestling uh, – Dustin Rhodes in a truck, and we got fired that night. Yeah. Oh, that you got fired that night? That night we really? got fired. Yeah. I remember that match. Yeah, yeah Eric <laughs> Bischoff calls me up the next day and says, Barry, I got some good news and bad news. And I said, oh, give me the good news. He says, hell of a match. Everybody popped. It was great. You know, the office loved it. And I said, what's the bad news? He goes, you're fired. I said, you got to be kidding me. So he says, don't give me a hard time. He says, I'll hire you back later on. Just take take some time off. So uh, I was fired. Dustin was fired. Mike Graham was fired. What's and the reasoning after you had a match that everybody popped for and enjoy it? We had blood in the match. Oh. And it was for video video deals and all this certain stuff. But, but we were told to do that. Yeah. So... Anyways, I ended up leaving, and then I came back and had a hell of a contract and didn't hardly even work. Oh, wow. <laughs> so best deal I ever had in wrestling. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Could last forever doing that. <laughs> I wish I was still under that contract. Yeah, I mean, you saved your body. You got all... <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. So then uh, after all that, then then I, it was kind of the end of my, my wrestling, and uh, I started a company with one of my best friends, and... We had that for 14 years oh, and wow. uh, sold it off three years ago, four years ago. And uh, now I just do autograph signs with Axe and we're on the road again, you know. And it's amazing to see. And this is, this is the second time I've run into you while you're doing this. And it's, it's always a pleasure. And uh, just a couple more things before I get you out of here is uh, when you had your own company, yeah. were you just running the company or were you training wrestlers? Just running the company. Do you I, ever do seminars or things like that? Uh, we do seminars every once in a while, but you know we're we go out twice a month doing what we're doing here, mm. and uh, we don't want to do any more than that because otherwise it's it's a real job, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, tomorrow we're in Syracuse, and then we come back, and then I go back to Orlando, and the traveling's killing us both. Yeah. You know, my knees, my back, and Bill's the same way. It's 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 hard. You know, when when somebody says, "Oh yeah, it's only an hour flight," well. You know, it's five hours because you well, got you got to get to the, you know, uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. So I was up at two thirty this morning, and here I am right now. I haven't been to bed yet. Yeah, yeah, you and know, it's and four o'clock in the afternoon. I right get now. out of here about eight o'clock or whatever, and hour and a half back, and yeah, you know, and then we got early morning tomorrow again. So yeah, yeah. So it's not fun doing that. <laughs> yeah. You know? And especially because, you know, obviously you've, you've put your time in. You said 1981 you started, and it's 2024, yeah. so, like, that's completely understandable. That being said, is there anybody that you can think of off the top of your head that you didn't get a chance to ever work with but you would have liked to? I would have liked to have had single matches and had a run with Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah. I really would have. Yeah. It just wasn't in the cards, you know. Would you have liked to do that as Smash? As Smash. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That. I really would have. I, uh... I thought we would have had great matches, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that was that was the one thing I wish I could have done. All right. You know? Yeah. No. I mean, and and at the time, I I wouldn't have been shocked to see that as a kid watching at that time. Demolition was the team; they were the guys. Right. So for to, for one of you to go after Hogan right. would have made perfect sense to me. <laughs> well, you know, and I thought it would be perfect for Axe and Smash to jump Hulk. And oh yeah. Put the boots to him and leave him laying. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, and then which one of us wrestles them, you know? Yeah, the story starts writing itself from there. And then we would never cheat, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. And so. I got to say, you know, Kiss just retired, but you guys are still out doing your thing. So the face paint that you wear has outlasted Kiss right now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I appreciate so. you being on hey. the show. I, you take I, care of yourself. I thank you Good so much you. for this. You too. All right. And uh, if you wanted to plug anything, feel free. But if not, you know. Plug retirement, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take everything. It easy.
Once again, Rock Soldiers, that was Demolition Smash, Repo Man, Barry Darso, however you know him, he is a legend in the wrestling business, and it was really cool of him to just jump on uh, impromptu like that and to give us uh, such a great interview. So thank you to Barry Darso, and thank you to you listeners, and please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, whatever you listen to your podcast on, we're on. Also, please give us a follow on social media, A-B-A-O Pod on Instagram, X, and Facebook. And uh, if you should be so inclined, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And we will catch you guys next week on the All Bets Are Off podcast. Bye.